that reduced. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my privilege to rise today to deliver my maiden speech and respond to the speech from the throne. Thank you to the Lieutenant Governor for delivering such a forward-thinking speech, looking to the future of Alberta. Now, even though this is my maiden speech, I've actually spoken many times in this legislature about my community, and yesterday MLA for Lethbridge West expounded on the more of the reasons we feel the way we do about our home. I love Lethbridge. Words can't accurately express the depth and breadth of the diversity of my community. To help you understand why I feel this way, I will give you just a few details about my constituency, which may give you a glimpse uh, at the diversity in the place I call home. My riding is home to 25 schools, 26 church organizations, 15 senior and care facilities, the Norbridge Senior Citizens Association, of which I am a member, the exhibition grounds, where among many other things, Family Fest is celebrated on New Year's Eve. Spitz Stadium, home of the Lethbridge Bulls. Henderson Lake, probably one of the most walked pathways in all of southern Alberta and lays alongside Henderson Golf Course. The Chinook Regional Hospital and Lethbridge College. There are a variety of businesses, large and small. They are evidence of the entrepreneurial spirit within my community. There are parks and community associations, Sikokotoki Friendship Centre. There is the Polish Canadian Club, the German Canadian Club, the Italian Canadian Club, the Nika Yuko Gardens, the Southern Alberta Ethnic Association, Outreach, the Bhutanese community, and now the Sef uh, Syrian refugee community. My constituents are my neighbours. They sing with me in church, uh, in the church choir at MacKillop. They volunteer with me at the Labour Day barbecue, or weed the vegetables for the food bank with me in the community garden, or be part of the team for the Dragon Boat Festival, or attend SACPA to keep abreast of what is happening in public affairs. Um, we are a diverse group of people who work together to make our community better. This, my dream job, is to do the best I can to represent all of my constituents. I spent some time thinking about uh, how to incorporate what I want to share with you and how to do that while providing a reasoned response to the throne speech. So here goes. I will begin my story by telling you how I came to be here today. I grew up in a home in St. John's, Newfoundland, where political discussion occurred on a pretty regular basis at the kitchen table. It was there where I learned about the purpose of a government and a little about debate. There were six of us. I learned that the world of politics did not appear to be open to women and in Newfoundland that the church exerted considerable influence. This left me quite ill at ease. I attended Memorial University in the late 60s and early 70s in the Faculty of Education and Physical Education. I played on the junior and then senior varsity basketball teams and was the only member of the university's tra women's track team. I saw the lack of funding for women's teams. In fact, for me to attend the university track and field ch uh, championships in Winnipeg, my track club paid for my student flight pass because the university did not have money assigned in their budget for me to participate. I was a nationally ranked sprinter, so some pressure was raised, but money was not. Eventually, I believe things changed, but not necessarily equal funding for male and female teams. The lesson I kept seeing over and over again was that things were not always equal for men and women, and that just seemed to be a matter of course. I believed and still believe this is wrong. 
Throughout my life, I have seen Throughout my life, I have seen this inequality raise its ugly head over and over again. I have shared my story about my violent marriage and how inequality played a role in that situation. So now I will move forward to my career in the public service. Almost immediately after being hired within the federal public service in 1982, uh, I became part of the fight for pay equity which for the women of the public service lasted for 15 years. For the women working at the post office, it was a 30-year battle. During my time in the federal public service, I was elected as local president for two different locals in which I was a member. I chaired three different regional women's committees and was elected to the senior executive of my national union representing 60,000 members in the NCR. These experience, experiences honed my skills to recognize what little changes can actually mean in the broader picture, for good or bad. And that was certainly noted once the federal government settled its pay equity complaint. Changes began to happen within classification. And I would say they were not positive changes, but rather supported the status quo. Most of the clerical regulatory classifications became administrative services classifications, and those were top-loaded in the higher cl classifications with males and the lower with women, but now more difficult to prove disparity. Needless to say, I began searching for ways to stop this gender disparity. As you can see, Mr. Speaker, the tone of my presentation so far is about inequity and the ongoing struggle for gender parity. The Lieutenant, the Lieutenant Governor's speech was given on International Women's Day, and as she said, we reflect on past accomplishments and renew our call for change. I have identified many areas where societal acceptance of gender disparity perpetuates this situation. I have committed myself to changing this behavior by changing social, uh, societal acceptance of the status quo. I challenge women to accept nothing less than being fully respected and to be fully valued for all of their skills and abilities. Their worth. Their worth is no less or no more than a male counterpart. Equality lies in mutual respect and acceptance. I challenge the men of Alberta to do a little self-reflection and decide what they can do to be part of that mutual respect and learn what it is to truly value the women in their lives. I hope that during my tenure as MLA for Lethbridge East, this change will be forthcoming for the betterment of all Albertans. I believe this was the first reason why I came to be here today. Now, Mr. Speaker, for the second reason why I'm here. During the 32 and a half years I worked for the federal government, I saw firsthand the steps that were uh, being taken which began to erode the services for the public, where the bottom line became more important than the required services to be provided. I saw the federal government change hands several times and the erosion grow. In the last 10 years, I watched the destruction of so much of the incredible progress my own department had made towards protection of the public, reduction of the crime rate, and reduction of the cost to the public coffers, all of which was done by frontline staff working with offenders, assessing their issues, identifying their needs to address those issues, and finally assisting them in changing their behavior to become pro-social, law-abiding citizens. I saw, Mr. Speaker, an incredible Addictions Research Center shut down. 30 years of research on addictions, much needed research when working with a population struggling with all kinds of addictions. 
I saw a farming project shut down, projects that not only provided much needed job skills, pro-social activities, but also which provided food for institutions. I saw the similar cuts happening in almost every other department of the federal government. Service counters in CRA closed. Mm -hmm. I saw Canadians' individual income tax records being archived outside of our country with no way to protect the data included in those records, your personal records. Mr. Speaker, I returned to Alberta for the last three years of my career in corrections and realized very quickly that things had not gotten any better since I had left Alberta nine years earlier. The same kind of damage was happening here in Alberta with provincial departments under a previous government, with cuts to frontline staff and programs. For example, you no longer see work crews from the jails doing cleanup on the highways and secondary roads as you did in the past. There is no longer a work crew program where inmates were hired as a crew to work on local farms. As time moved forward, things continued to get worse. Cuts to frontline staff in hospitals and schools. Despite the drastic cuts that were made, it was actually costing more. Nurses were being forced to work overtime on a regular basis to cover shifts despite not having sufficient rest between shifts. No time for oneself or family. Had these positions not been cut, the stress of working constant overtime, the possibility of mistakes because staff were exhausted would not have occurred. Patients would not be at risk because of the exhaustion that was created by being forced to work so much overtime. Mr. Speaker, whether I was in the supermarket, walking in my neighbourhood, at the doctor's office, or even on the golf course, conversations all around me were about how bad things were with the ongoing cuts to services and how the government must change. A number of people asked me if I would consider running as I had a good understanding of the issues and could certainly represent their concerns and perhaps make change happen. I made the decision that I would run, and I retired from my position with the Correctional Service of Canada so that I could work full-time on a campaign. For 14 weeks prior to the May 5th election, I went door-to-door, -door, attended many events, and listened to Albertans. I continue to listen to Albertans and share their concerns with my colleagues in caucus and the ministries related to their issues. Now, Mr. Speaker, to the specifics of the throne speech. With the current status of the economy being drastically affected by the price of oil, this throne speech lays out a plan for not just surviving the downturn in oil prices, but thriving. It is a time to be encouraging businesses to grow. Not only is this a role that our government will be promoting, but this is a role that could easily be taken on by chambers of commerce in every single community. They could be encouraging local businesses to utilize the job incentive monies, to take advantage of the expanded access to workforce and skills training and retraining uh, people facing unemployment so that they can upgrade their skills. We are all in this together, and we all need to be promoting job creation and economic diversification if we are to take advantage of this opportunity in our province. In my community, as in every other community in Alberta, there is potential for growth. Growth does not happen unless we uh, move on that potential. For example, in Lethbridge, the Thabane poppy seed project has the potential of a $5 billion industry. Our mayor has sought support from both provincial and federal governments. Our provincial government continues to liaise with the federal government for the required federal approval of the project before April 1st, so that the project will be ready to go in time for this year's growing season. 
There are projects at both university and college to provide more diverse opportunity, including a joint project in agriculture. Growth in science programs, as an example of which is the work done by Dr. Uh, David Naylor and his team on the Herschel Spire Space Program. Our member for Sherwood Park. And Mr. Speaker, since I didn't actually finish, I'm going to finish, and uh, then I'll get to your question. Uh, so, um, Dr. Naylor was the Canadian lead through the Canadian Space uh, Agency on this world project. This kind of exposure to the world stage brings the university's programs and attracts incredible minds into these programs. This also helps to grow our local and provincial economy. Mr. Speaker, there are groups in my constituency, like Farming Smarter, the Agricultural Research Centre, who do the on-the-ground research to make the way we farm and our crops better. There are entrepreneurs in the city pursuing alternate energy, the biogas plant on the east side of Lethbridge, wind, solar, thermal, being pursued by individuals and at the university. Uh, and, of course, there is the destination project at the university. All of these projects and forward-thinking people recognize we need to invest in a greener, more sustainable economy. We recognize the need to diversify our energy markets. We need to supply the green energy for our own use, as well as expanding market access. In Lethbridge, we know that living in the Palliser Triangle, water is a precious commodity. We know we have been successful in the agricultural industry because of the utilization of irrigation and protection of our water supply. We also know that this is the second year of very little moisture, either on the ground or in the mountains which feed our reservoirs. We know the importance of pre protecting this resource. This was why a group called No Drilling Lethbridge grew very quickly to stop a proposed project which had planned to frack within our city limits and under the Old Man River. The company pulled out because of the outcry of over 75% of the population. My government understands the need for protection of our climate, and hence, this is why our government introduced the Climate Leadership Plan. Mr. Speaker, there are vulnerable populations in my community as well. Seniors, children, the homeless. This speech outlines that our government will not make things worse. We recognize trying to survive on a single commodity whose price is controlled outside our borders is not a wise course of action. We will maintain excellent services for Albertans to protect our most vulnerable. Now is not the time to make things worse by cutting essential frontline services and staff. Lethbridge sits on Treaty 7 Blackfoot territory, the edge of the largest uh, reserve in Canada. Many of our Indigenous brothers and sisters live in our community and deserve equal support. The vulnerabilities in our community are also their vulnerabilities, and hence the same supports are needed. Albertans are community-minded, caring and neighbourly. In tough times, we always pull together. I can go on to each point, but I know I'll run out of time. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I was elected to, do, uh, uh, to represent my constituents and make the best decisions I can, given the circumstances with which we are facing. I believe we can make the most of this situation by working together. We have an unlimited resource, and that is the people of this province. We can work through these tough times and thrive, and we will. Now, I must acknowledge the support I have always received from my kids and grandkids, without uh, which I could not go forward every day. It is also because of each of them and every constituent that I continue to fight for a better Alberta. I have also received and continue to receive the support from my incredible staff and EDA. Sherry, Ari, Esther, Mary, Terry, Judy, Bob, Patty, Doreen, Johanna, Johanna Nick, Bev, Henning, Mark, Leona, Tom and Anna. 
Thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me to be the best MLA I could possibly be.